Welcome to the Judaism From Within podcast. My name is Similara. The point and purpose of these discussions is to give an insight or a perspective from the teachings of Rapshamshin Rafal Hirsch, someone whose ideas and worldview I both love to teach and find personally inspiring. I hope you enjoy. When it comes to a festival like Rosh Hashanah, it's often difficult to get a grasp on the ideas that we're trying to sort of internalize or the ideas we're trying to express. The myriad of different symbols and imagery that's used can often be overwhelming. And finding a grounding or a direction that we're trying to articulate or we're trying to internalize when it comes to Rosh Hashanah can be difficult. As a useful springboard to our discussion, a question I've always had as a child and growing up, as well as a question that's often put towards me, is that when it comes to Rosh Hashanah, do I actually think what I do on this day will determine how much money, how healthy I will be in the coming year? Because it only takes someone with a cursory glance of society that people who don't take Rosh Hashanah seriously don't do worse. A person who has a lot of concentration over their prayers over Rosh Hashanah doesn't do financially better than the person who doesn't, isn't necessarily going to avoid a sickness. At least from the point of view of looking at the data that we can access as human beings. Now my point isn't that there isn't an effect. But in a grounded way of talking about Rosh Hashanah or making it meaningful to you, if you're looking at the world, you cannot see a direct effect. Now, I do understand there are answers to this question about the potential for the future year, etc., etc., and things that happen good could have happened bad, and things that happen bad, and they could have been worse. I understand that, but that doesn't help the question. What we're dealing with in our discussion today is how is Rosh Hashanah directly meaningful, directly in a grounded sense. Or the way I, or sorry, the the imagery I use is explaining it to someone in the office who doesn't share your metaphysical assumptions. I often find, at least in my life and in the life of my students, that if I can explain a Jewish concept in a way that doesn't rely on a host of religious assumptions, and thereby my ability to explain it to a third party becomes stronger, because my involvement is total, It's not only a religious involvement of something that I am committed to because I have a belief or I have a commitment that this should have an effect. I am completely committed because I recognize the effect in a direct sense. And that's what we're going to do in this week's discussion. With Rav Hirsch's perspective on the imagery and on the symbols of Rosh Hashanah, we will gain, hopefully, an insight about how it's directly relevant in a practical sense of the word that you can see how your work on the day of Rosh Hashanah, by taking the messages and the symbolism to heart, a actual manifestation in your year to come. And Rav Hirsch's method of doing it is truly profound. When it comes to symbolism in general, it's often free game. People have a symbol and they add an idea to it, because symbolism has that risk of opening the door to anyone's ability to connect an idea to the symbol. But what Rav Hirsch does in a truly beautiful way when it comes to the shofar, he grounds it in the biblical narrative. He grounds it in the journey of the Jewish people in the desert. And this is something Rav Hirsch does when it comes to Rosh Hashanah. He takes the shofar, shows us its symbolic expression, connects it to a meaningful message of Rosh Hashanah and the coming year, but in the most beautiful way, he grounds it in the biblical narrative. And that is often mis... And that is often overlooked. An ability to come out with a symbol or a an idea that rises from an object can be easy because there's many different ideas that you can take from an object. But to be able to ground it in the biblical narrative is something truly unique. The most relevant symbol when it comes to Rosh Hashanah is the shaifa, the shaifa that we blow in the synagogue. Now the noise and the notes of the shaifa for Rav Hirsch are very significant. What do we do? We blow a blast, then we blow a broken blast, like um, a, a stuttered blast, and then another blast again. Basically a clear note, a stuttered note, and a clear note. Now, this is often described as referring to different sort of emotions, and, but for Rav Hirsch, what he does is he takes us back to the source, the source of where this idea came from. Why do we do these notes? Our ancient sages derive where we get these notes from, the narrative in the desert when the Jewish people were traveling. Now, the sounds that were taken forth, the sounds that were used to rally the people, to gather the people, to arouse the people, to send the people forward, were also a blast of a trumpet. And these sounds are what we sort of attach to, to connect to the idea of Rosh Hashanah and its meaning. So let's break it down. Rav Hirsch says there is a meaning embedded in the narrative 
that has a parallel to our lives, which is the meaning and the opportunity that Rosh Hashanah affords us. The first blast the Jewish people would hear in the desert would be to arouse them. They were camped. They were a nomad people. They were traveling through the desert. The first blast would be to arouse them, to call them to attention. In daily life, in a campsite, things take hold of you. Things, there's part of your day, there's part of what has to be done. You would stop. The first blast would draw them to attention. The second blast would be the signal that they would have to pack up and move. The symbol that they would have to stop what they were doing and ready themselves to move on to the next place. And the final blast. The final blast would mean to move forward to the new destination. Now, in a basic way, we can already see how this has a parallel in a deep psychological way to our lives. Rav Hirsch says the first blast of the shofar is an awakening. It is a rallying cry. It is a call for contemplation. It is a call for reflection. It is a call to stand back from your daily life. Like in the desert, people are preoccupied and it's a time to stop. Rosh Hashanah is a time to stop. The blast that the Jewish people heard in the desert and the blast we hear today are the same. It's to take pause in your journey in life. The symbolism here is truly powerful. That is a parallel that is perfectly relevant to our lives because the journey through the desert for the Jewish people is meant to parallel a journey through life. The second blast, to pack up and make ready. What have you got on you that you don't need to take with you? What parts of you do you need to leave behind? And I mean that in a deeply psychological sense. When you get up and you move, what you don't need for your travels, you ditch. The dead wood you let burn. You let it fall off. You shed what you don't need. And what you don't need, you leave behind. But that takes introspection of the step before. You ready yourself. And in life, there are things that we don't want to take forward into our next year. There are things that we shouldn't be taking forward into our next year, be it on the negative sense of how we treat someone. If there is a way in my life that I treat someone that maybe I shouldn't, that should be left behind. If there's a way I'm acting in my life, if there's a way that I'm acting in my life that doesn't reflect the mission of a Jew, the mission that I as a Jewish man is called upon to live, I should be leaving that behind. I am packing myself up and I'm ready for my journey through the next year. And then lastly, the last final call, the call to move on to the next destination. Packing up camp is difficult. Moving on to the next stage is difficult because where you are now is comfortable. Yeah, packing up is hard. Packing off burns because there are parts of you that you need to leave behind because you're comfortable. The metaphor of dead wood is actually quite apt. It should burn. That doesn't make it easy. The things that shouldn't be part of you should fall away. When you break camp, you're not comfortable because you were comfortable before, hence you were camped. In the journey of life, you're camped sometimes. But the things you have to drop and leave behind, and that is the second call that rings in our ears when it comes to Rosh Hashanah. And the final call, the final call to move forward, the final call for the Jewish people to see that destination and work their way towards it, and the final call to us in our lives to refocus on our final goal. What is the goal? What is my life's goal? How will I project into my future a goal? Now, for me, hopefully, that will be the moral mission that I'm on as a human being. I project that into the future, and I orient my life towards that goal. I make every step of my life a stepping stone towards that goal. I make that final goal, that last call, the goal to move forward, to refocus where I'm going next year. So we've got these three callings. The calling of contemplation. The calling of reflection. The calling of stop and step out of your life. The second call, the call of, you know, there's things that have to be worked on. Not simple contemplation, not simple thoughts, but action is needed, action is required. I need to talk this out. I need to work out what needs to be left behind. And the final, the moving forward, the focus on that future goal and orientating my life towards that future goal. Making every step in my life meaningful because it is a stepping stone towards that goal. So, to recap these three stages, and they're parallel to the journey of the Jewish people in the desert. The first, the calling to pay attention. The second blast to pack up, and the third blast to move forward. So to put it in to other terms, if someone asks me, what is my Rosh Hashanah about? This is what I mean by Rosh Hashanah. And here's the best part. A person who does this practice, this threefold calling, This threefold exercise, you will see your year turn out for the better. It's not a 
how you act on Rosh Hashanah very much does lay out your year. How do you focus your mind for the rest of the year? Your year will reveal itself towards that goal. If a person's focusing on something, things in his life pop out to help towards that goal because you're subconsciously focused on that idea. So anything that's relevant to that reveals itself to you. So when it comes to Rosh Hashanah, how your Rosh Hashanah is lived out very much does determine your coming year. I'm not saying there are not other ideas that are relevant to Rosh Hashanah and how our next year will turn out, but I'm saying this is a meaningful one that I always connect it to. How my year turns out is very much determined on how I step through the two days of Rosh Hashanah. And just to end off, because Rav Hirsch sort of fits it into another triad expression that we have within the, uh, within the festival of Rosh Hashanah. The call of Teshuvah, Tefillah, and Tzedakah. Teshuvah, that introspection, that reflection of where am I? What am I doing? Step outside of your life, outside of your daily routine, and look at yourself. That's the goal of Teshuvah. That's the reflection that a person needs to do to go on that journey of Teshuvah. Tefillah, you see how you stand in reference to what you want to do. Rav Hirsch's perception, Rav, Hirsch, Rav Hirsch's definition of tefillah is one of introspection from the root palal to judge. Tefillah is a reflection on the self, lehit palal. You judge yourself, it's in the reflexive. Tefillah is a, an expression of self-judgment. How do I look at myself? Am I living up to the goals that I want to have in my life? If not, what needs to drop? What do I have that I don't need that needs to drop? That's the goal of tefillah. Tefillah is the introspection articulated. How do I live up to these ideas that I'm articulating in tefillah? Because that's what we do in tefillah. We say ideas. We repeat ideas. We repeat the same thing again and again and see how we as human beings reflect that. So the first stage, teshuvah, the reflection, the introspection, that first call. The second, tefillah. How do I stand in reflection to these ideas? And what doesn't reflect these ideas? So what needs to drop? What part of me do I not want to take along in this journey? And the last one, the final blast to move forward. Sadaka, and the final blast in Judaism, when it comes to where it all works its way to, is the realization in action. Things that stay in the mode of the mind, in the mouth, are meaningless. That's not where the goal is. The goal is how you live your life out. And in Judaism, the action that you do is what determines whether you are truly completing this mission. Thank you very much for listening, and have a wonderful Rosh Hashanah, and a Happy New Year. And I just want to use this opportunity as well to thank all my listeners on across the platforms, be it iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, and WhatsApp. I wish you all a happy, healthy year.